Great, Lorenz, thank you so much for joining me. Um, so tell me a little bit about how your family got into the wine trade and when you joined the, joined the family, family winery. Sure. Um, so basically, my family is making wine for quite a while. Um, I'm now the fourth generation, basically continuing uh, the, the wine, the, the wine business. However, it started, everything started very small um, with um, my grand grandfather. He had, I think, 0 0.3 hectares of, of vineyards. Um, and then, of course, a bit of agricultural land, uh, some cattle. Um, and it actually was my, and then it, it grew slightly, uh, but my grandfather was really the one turning it into like 100% winery because he, what he did is he sold um, the, the, the agricultural land, so in the flatter area, in order to purchase uh, sort of the steeper uh, slopes um, because he wanted to focus 100% on winemaking. He was not meant to take it over, but since um, his older brothers, they all fell in, in the Second World War and he was the youngest. So he was the one, uh, now he had to take it over um, without, um, so very young, with the age of 15. And his father was by then already quite ill. So he literally um, as a, had no youth actually um and and sometimes <laughs> you still feel it with my grandfather because he has no understanding for things <laughs> that, that teenagers would do like my cousin is in his age now and he has absolutely no he doesn't understand why he would you would need a hobby or things like this well anyway um but let's come back to and and he he was basically the one actually quite brave back then because um, it was not, uh, you know, like after the World War, Austria had not such a big, you know, wine industry or, or also not, not, a, not a gastronomy who would, would, um, would consume much wine, which does not, what was not much money. Um, but still he's, he knew so, he said, I don't want, because I asked him once, why did you do this? Because it was actually quite crazy. And, and he said, yeah, a lot of people thought I'm crazy. And he was very young. But I think it was this youth also that allowed him to do it um, or to take such a brave decision because looking back at it, at it, it was amazing that he did it because he sold the, the agricultural land for quite uh, good money because that's what people wanted back then, fertile agricultural land. And for a very little, and he got a lot of land on the best slopes that we are now cultivating, like Geisberg, Heiligenstein. He bought it. Um, so actually, it was my grandfather's decision back then that enabled us to have such great spots um, for winemaking now. That's brilliant. Um, so a real, a real pioneer of the of the time, I guess. Yes, I would say so. And then, and and then when he sort of then gave handed over the business to my mom and to my aunt. Um, but he split it the winery, like it often happens also in, yeah. uh, in Burgundy, for example. So both daughters got half of the of the vineyards, um, and from there on, my parents took it on um, uh, with uh, I think six hectares back then. Um, and yeah, meanwhile we're cultivating thirty hectares. Wow! And and, uh, and what year did you join? What year did you fully fully I joined, get by? <laughs> yeah, fully. I, I I basically I joined. 2015 was my first vintage okay. and yeah. we had quite um my, my dad and me we get along quite well so luckily um so 15 was this trial year so i i said okay i'll come home and i'll i'll do a full harvest so i have all the responsibility for for the for the winemaking and and, and also in the vineyards um and then let's talk again in one year um if we're both happy and if it feels good or if it's too early maybe um and actually, we never had this second conversation. And, <laughs> five and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so where were, you, where were you before? Where did you, were you studying winemaking or did you do a couple um, of vintages yes. elsewhere? So actually, I, um, um, I, I always had a passion for wine and I always loved the area. Um, but uh, since I was 15, I firmly believe soccer player. Um, but then I had quite a bad injury with 15 when it was time to go to the soccer school, actually, so um, to the high school. And um, then my father said, okay, you know what, you, you couldn't do this, all these tests because you were injured. Just do one year in the winemaking high school. And then next year you try again. And it was a bit of the same thing. <laughs> he was always clever doing this with me. <laughs> yeah. and I never did the, the and, I, and I didn't go to the, to the soccer school anymore because I liked it so much at the winemaking school. I said, no, I, I want to stay. 
um, and and from there on, uh, the I would say the direction was a bit yeah, it's yeah, worth Steve, behind. Steve uh, well, I guess at the um, age of fifteen, it runs in the family. At fifteen, you've got to be running an estate by then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and then um, I I went to the winemaking high school. And did a few internships uh, abroad um, after the after the, the A levels. Um, I went for 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 half a year to New Zealand, and then during my studies, which were business studies, so that had nothing to do with wine, but always in between, um, I I did uh, vintages abroad. So in, in South Africa, in one in Germany, one in Austria. So in total five five. Five harvests that I did with other wineries, um, yeah. And then after my my studies, I finished my studies. I I, I did this one year <laughs> at home, and then I stayed. <laughs> nice. So for uh, we, what for you typifies your region? Actually, mm. both. Your, well, let's go for Austria and the Cantal. Yeah. So yeah. on the world stage, what what uh, what do people look for in Austrian yeah. wine, and then more specifically in wines from the Cantal? Yeah, and I, I think it goes a bit uh, in hand what you just said is like because I think what people look abroad for when they think about Austria very much they look for the stylistic that we have in our region, which are um, minerality driven uh, dry white wines. I think that's what most of the people internationally still connect to Austria. We also have great reds in the Burgenland and we have amazing Sauvignons in the in 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 Styria in the south of Austria, but when it comes, I think to this one uh, wine that what people would name it probably would be Grüner Veltliner, and and that's what we are best here in Kamtal. Um, that's what we do besides the Riesling also, um, and 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 I think the Kamtal is a very yeah the whole Danube area, including the Kamtal, the Kremstal, the Treisental, the Wachau. That's really what I think. That this is the profile of, of Austrian wine a bit um, that, that people have in mind. I think Definitely. when, they, I agree. when yeah. they think of Austria. So obviously, running in your family, these great varieties mm. running the family: Grüner Veltliner, mm. Riesling. Yeah. Are they great varieties you always saw yourself working with, or would you like to be working with something else? I mean, doing um, a vintage in, in New Zealand, you must have worked with a bit of Sauvignon Blanc as well. Yeah, um, uh, I think. Um, of course, I think as a winemaker, you're always interested in, in varieties, but I think um, the way we understand winemaking, um, the variety actually isn't so important. Um, it's more about the, um, the typicity of the region. And I think many varieties can express typicity. It's not uh, a Riesling, for example, is a variety that can do it very well. Um, and, 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 and Grüner as well, and, and also Chardonnay can do it. And I think, um, for me, no, I've never seen myself like in a city. I would love to work with this and that variety. I think it's for me, it's more about really expressing the, the differences between the single vineyards and, the, and the, 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 the village appellations that we do have, no matter what variety it is. And maybe we never know, maybe it's not Grüner Vetlina in 20 years anymore. I think. Um, I mean, this year has shown us that it can be cold also still in Austria during a harvest and rainy. Um, but the, the last couple of vintages that I've seen so far, 2020 was different. It always became warmer and warmer and warmer. And, and really, um, I mean, if the trend continues that way, I think Grüner Vetlina might be a variety that could have, um, or at least where we would need to rethink our concepts and maybe also what used to be a top vineyard today for Grüner might not be top vineyard in 20 years anymore because it simply will get too warm there and then maybe okay. some colder spots will be the the best uh, appellations good so you've you've touched on style a little bit but uh mm. what uh how what typifies the Gruner Veltliner style of your region I, there's probably there's quite a lot of debate in your I guess as well yeah. as to how yeah. it should be produced because there's many different ways it can be produced um what for you really typifies the, the region and the style that you're, you're producing? Mm. Yeah, I would say um, a classical Grüner Veltliner for me um, really always needs to have this fresh, nice and dry minerality. Um, that's what I always look for in, in, in our wines and, and in, a, in a typical Grüner Veltliner from the Kamtal area. And it shouldn't be too, too, too heavy. 
uh, a certain lightness. I think that's also what characterizes um, our area, especially the Kamptal, since it's the most northern uh, wine growing region in, in the Danube Valley. Um, and, and not being overly aromatic. Uh, a classical Grüner Vetlina is more subtle to me. Um, it's, it's not overly fruit driven, nor it's, um, it's uh, how should I say, um, it's very, a, a very uh, balanced wine, all in all. And I think that's also why a um, lot of sommeliers like to use it for food pairings because it it's always pairs quite well, no matter with what dish. Um, and, <laughs> I know I said it already to you once, but this um, a, a, a somebody once told me for him, Grüner Vetlina is uh, the chameleon of all wines because it really uh, adapts to the dish. And I think that's what a Grüner Vetlina, a good Grüner Vetlina should, should do. Uh, it should be a very flexible food pairing wine. And, and another characteristic that I always look for is um, a nice, ripe, uh, but present uh, acidity. Grüner Vetlina is not is not actually an overly uh, acidic grape variety. It has, doesn't have very high acid levels. So that's why dryness is very important for me in our wines. So uh, I don't like it if they um, have this drop of residual sugar. Um, it, that's a different story with, with the Riesling. But for Grüner, uh, I like it really bone dry. Uh, brilliant. And your um, single vineyard sites, one thing I've always loved mm. about your wines is there is a, a really defining character from each single vineyard site, whether it be from Gruner Veltliner or from Riesling. And so are you making those wines in a very similar way or is it really just the vineyard yeah. speaking to the uh, speaking to us through the wines? Yeah, that, that was also probably that was the one thing that I uh, when I came and joined in 15, um, I really changed a bit. Is what you what or what I did is when I when I worked the first vintage with my father, I asked a lot of questions. So, so why is Geisberg tasting like this, and why is Rena like this, and why does a Heiligenstein taste like this? And um and one one answer my father gave me, I was not hundred percent happy with, and he said, yeah, you know, like the, the Geisberg tastes like this because we ferment it in stainless steel tanks and it stays on the yeast. Uh, for that and that amount of time and Reina goes 20% go into small bricks and that's why Reina tastes it and that was for me uh, something I really wanted to change um, and actually I standard it sounds a bit weird but I standardized the, the winemaking process if you want to say so yeah, sure. I'm not making a difference uh, between uh, Gaspe and Reina in the winemaking because we also don't make a difference in the vineyard um, <laughs> and and that's how you truly can reflect the character, I think. Um, because what, what we also saw is with age, the, the true character of a vineyard always comes through, no matter, even if the winemaking was different. After 10 years, you just notice that it's a Geisberg. Very often, uh, then after 20 years, even the variety sometimes vanishes, but you can still um, taste the sense of place. And that was something I wanted really, I tried that also when our wines are young, so after two years, that you already sort of that the difference in the wines really comes from the vineyard, not so much from the winemaking. From the winemaking, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. No, that's nice. So, with the uh, the style of wine very set in your mind, what do you think mm. is the uh, really overriding factors that typifies um, the ability to create that style? Yeah, I think it's it's uh, the combination of um, both the the the, the terroir. Also, it's a terroir, yeah. So, but it's a combination of the soil that we have, um, which is perfect for for this style of wine with um or for the Grüner Vetlina we have this layer of loess uh, this is always uh, I think uh, this one term that or this soil type that comes up when when we talk about Grüner Vetlina which is sort of the the working like a sponge uh, uh, and and takes a lot of water has these water reserves that that Grüner needs in combination with the climate that we do have in the Kamsal um we have, and we see it now, um, extreme, uh, very, the, the, or the extreme, we have um, two basic, two climatic zones that collide in the Kamsal or in the whole Danube area. It's the, the warm Pannonian influence, uh, the Pannonian winds coming from um, Vienna, a lot of warm air streams. And then we have a lot of cold air streams coming from the north um, through the Kamp Valley carried by the, the Kamp River. And this, this sort of collision of this, those two um, um, climatic influence factors create a lot of temperature drops between or are very 
quite extreme temperature drops um, or differences between day and night. And that's, I think, essential for the, for the, the aroma development in our grapes mm-hmm. and also the acidity levels we do get in, in our wine. And I guess Lus is also a fantastic soil medium for organic viticulture as well. It's much easier to, to farm as it's like that sponginess. It's yes. uh, much easier to work than it would be on a heavy clay or gravel soil. So that, I guess, exactly or that uh, organic working is also really important for your wine production as well. Yeah, exactly. And especially for the Gruner Vetlina. Um, and, and that's why also Gruner and Riesling are so great <laughs> for our region because they are complementary. Mo- on most of the spots where um, Gruner wouldn't grow, it's perfect for Riesling and vice versa. Um, so a lot of people ask me this, yeah, you produce a, a Riesling and the Gruner from Geisberg. How is that possible? Um, th- sure. Because the reason is it's a slope and on the upper part where we have almost no layer of loess, it's perfect it's for, for Riesling because it's yeah, not yeah. very fertile and Riesling likes to sort of uh, fight struggle. With, uh, <laughs> and to struggle, exactly. <laughs> and, and Gruner doesn't like it that much. So Gruner we have on the bottom half planted where we have a nice layer of less, about one and a half, two meters, which is this oh. sort of, um, yeah, energy provider for the variety because Gruner is a bit more sensitive to, to stress than Riesling. So uh, obviously playing football would be one thing, but if you yeah. weren't, making wine or perhaps playing football, what would you be doing? <laughs> a professional soccer player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, so I mean, there's no other answer, is there? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. I think there would be, no, uh, there would be many things where I could see myself, honestly. I think now, of course, it probably would be something in the wine world. I'm saying this now, but uh, because I'm... Yeah, by five wine, years yeah. down the road in the wine trade, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but but um, I think you know I could mm, I, I probably couldn't see myself in a hundred percent office job, um, sure. um, something where I'm in contact with people. Um, but uh, there would be many things I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, obviously you've done vintages out, yeah. outside of Austria and Germany. Yeah. Where where would you like to be making wine if it wasn't in in Kampel? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. um, probably in the Nahe. Okay, yeah, yeah. Nice, yeah. yeah. Right, so, so very specific. I mean, yeah, very specific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm a big fan of, of the style of Riesling they produce. Um, yeah. That's why I would, would back. I could, and, and I love the region. It's, you know, like most, a lot of wine regions are very beautiful, but uh, the Nahe has um, it's a small maybe because it feels a bit <laughs> like home to me. This is also yeah, this yeah, nice. smaller structured wine region. I like it a lot. Yeah, that's um, yeah, it's quite a romantic notion, really, to to, to be that niche and specific. It's uh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, of course, what would be your desert? I- would Desert Island wine be a Gruner Veltliner, or have you got other 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 favorites up your sleeve? Well, as I said, uh, Riesling could be something that I take with me from the Nile. Um, <laughs> yeah. But if if it's only one that I can take, I'd probably take uh, not even one of our top singers, maybe the, the Grüne Veltliner Strasse, because if it's only Every one day. one, yeah. <laughs> then this would be my choice. <laughs> Brilliant. Lorenz, thank you so much for chatting. It's been a real pleasure. I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Pleasure. <laughs> speak to you soon. <laughs>